beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. Well, that Word, we physicists think, was the quantum. In the beginning was the quantum principle. There was nothing. But the quantum principle says that even nothing is unstable. Well, if nothing is unstable, bubbles form. Tiny little bubbles form, which then begin to expand rapidly, and that's the Big Bang. Big Bangs happen all the time in an ocean of nothing. Can monkeys understand calculus? If you were to sit down with an ape and teach the ape from birth, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, the derivative of F of X is equal to G of X. Could you get an ape to understand calculus? The answer is no. Evolutionary speaking, the mind of an ape is genetically incapable of understanding higher mathematics and calculus. So what gives us the right to claim that we can understand the secret of the stars? Well, it just turned out that our brain is, in fact, smart enough. Even though we evolved from intelligent apes on a minor planet in a minor backwash of the known galaxy, we're still intelligent enough to understand the secret of the universe itself. My goal in life is to find an equation an equation perhaps no more than one inch long, which will summarize everything we know about the physical universe. An equation one inch long, which eluded Einstein, which will allow us to understand where the Big Bang came from, where the galaxies and supernovas come from, where life comes from, where DNA comes from, where humans fit into this larger puzzle, maybe even eventually solving the puzzle of love itself. That's my goal, to be able to, quote, read the mind of God, unquote. We physicists are the only scientists who can say the word God and not blush. If you walk outside and you say the word God to most people, they think of a personal God. That's not the God that we physicists sometimes invoke. The way Einstein looked at it is that there really are two kinds of gods. There is the God of prayer, the personal God, the God of Isaac and Moses and Jacob. However, there's also the God of harmony, the God that says that there is a reason why things are the way they are. Why did it have to be so simple? Why should there be order rather than chaos? Why should there be an equation this long which will hopefully explain all physical reality? It didn't have to be that way. Some people ask me the question, are you physicists so narrow and so focused that when you see a beautiful painting and you see light shimmering on, on a pond or you see a beautiful sunrise, do you see equations? And I confess, I do. It must be a strange world not being a scientist, going through a life not knowing or maybe not caring about where the air came from and where the stars at night came from and how far they are away from us. I want to know. As a kid, I guess I could have become bitter because my parents, being Japanese-American immigrants, even though they were born in the United States, were kept in a concentration camp for four years, from 1942 to 1946. After they were let out of the concentration camps, they had no money. They had no way to see their dreams realized except perhaps through their children. So I realized from a very early age that if something were to happen to me, I would have to do it myself. And so when I was in high school, I went to my mom one day and I said, Mom, 
I want to build an atom smasher. I want to build a 2.3 million electron volt Betatron in the garage. And my mom sort of just stared at me and said, sure, why not? I wanted to create antimatter in my backyard. I spent a lot of time at Stanford getting the blueprints, reading the theory behind atom smashers. The goal was to create a beam of energy, 2.3 million electron volts, sufficient to create a beam of antimatter, which I could then basically play with in, in the garage. Thinking back, I realized that when I was a child of eight, there was a moment of epiphany that changed everything around me. My elementary school teacher walked in the room one day, very somber, and announced to the whole class that Einstein had just died. That evening, every newspaper on the earth flashed a picture of his desk with the unfinished manuscript of his greatest unfinished work. I wanted to know what was in that book. It was like a detective story. I wanted to piece together who done it. I wanted to put together all the pieces. And as the years went by, I began to finally realize that Einstein was on the greatest chase of all time. I began to realize slowly over the years that what he was embarking on was the greatest scientific quest imaginable. figure skating. I once brought my kids to the ice rink and I paid good money to see them fall flat on their face. And I said to myself, gee, I could save some money by simply learning how to ice skate myself and teaching my kids how to ice skate. Well, after a while, I began to like it more than them. <laughs> and then I began to realize that there's sheer beauty and elegance of Newtonian physics here. And I feel the power of Newton's laws of motion. It's beautiful, elegant, and it's very elemental. And I began to realize that, yes, just like physics is based on symmetry, it's based on symmetry of mathematics, ice skating is based on the elegance of Newton's three laws of motion. In nature, we often see a left hand and a right hand that work in synchronization. We know that the left hand, the right hand are coordinated by the brain and they can work in concert. In terms of the universe, we have the world of the very small and the world of the very big. The world of the very small is called the quantum theory, the theory of electrons, neutrons, and protons. But we also have the theory of the very big, the theory of relativity, the theory of Einstein, the theory of big bangs and black holes and curved space-time. The problem is, and this is the fundamental problem in all of physics, the left hand and the right hand don't coordinate. They don't like each other. They're based on different physical principles. They're based on different mathematics. They're not compatible. Think of taking an aardvark, a whale, and a platypus, and scotch tape them together with tape, 
and declare that to be nature's most elegant product of evolution. Well, you would laugh. This contraption, this animal glued together with scotch tape, can barely walk. Well, that's the standard model, the quantum theory. It is one of the ugliest theories known to science. No one can believe that this is the final theory. Then comes string theory. The history of science is often the history of paradigm shifts. The world before Copernicus was the world of magic. It was the world of superstition and demons. It was the world of, quote, common sense. Common sense said that the sun rises and it goes around the earth. Copernicus was an old, dying man when he wrote down his greatest work challenging the orthodoxy of the church. Copernicus was no fool. He knew that if he had published his work about the fact that the earth goes around the sun, he'd be tortured. Copernicus realized that he was proposing a paradigm shift for the ages. It turns out that these paradigm shifts only take place once every few decades to centuries, but we're now witnessing a new paradigm shift. The world we see around us, the world we can touch, the three-dimensional world of atoms and molecules is now being replaced by a world where we have vibrating strings moving in ten-dimensional hyperspace. That's a paradigm shift beyond all paradigm. We're now shifting away from simply looking at the Earth going around the Sun to a universe where we're now literally leaving the universe of the Sun and the Earth altogether and going into hyperspace. Two thousand years ago, there were a group of Greek philosophers called the Pythagoreans. And they worked out the laws of harmony on a violin string. They realized if you take a violin string and you looked at the resonance of it, the resonances corresponded to integers, and they were marveled that music could be explained in terms of a vibrating string. And they then said that perhaps the universe could be explained by the laws of harmony. We now believe that we can revive the thoughts of the early Pythagoreans and explain the universe through vibrating superstrings. Some people say, you know, Professor, when I see a chair, I know what a chair is, I can feel a chair, touch a chair. But you physicists, when you talk about strings, what the hell is that? Well, yes, we are all agreed what a chair is. The chair has four legs, and it's made out of wood or metal, and it has atoms inside. However, what makes up the atoms? Well, if you look inside the atoms, there's electrons whizzing around the nucleus. Well, what are they made out of? You can smash them apart. Inside the nucleus, there are uh, protons and neutrons. Well, we've smashed them. What's inside neutrons and protons? Well, we think there's something called quarks. Well, does it stop there? Does it stop at the quarks? We now believe that if you had a microscope and could look at the quarks themselves, we would realize that they are nothing but little loops. Little tiny vibrating loops vibrating at a certain mode. And if you whacked it hard enough, it would turn into an electron. And if you whacked it hard enough again, it would turn into light. So in other words, we're talking about an elemental uber form of matter. One object, such that if it simply vibrates in a different way, it can create all the things we see around us. Therefore, instead of having this whole zoo of subatomic particles, you just have 
the strength. However, this theory had a very big defect, a defect so great that it led to the near death of this theory. This theory predicts that the universe exists in 10-dimensional hyperspace. And I remember the very instant that was worked out in the early 70s. At that point, the cynics said, this is Star Trek. Beam me up, Scotty. I mean, you want us to believe that there are hidden dimensions out there? just like the mystics used to talk about ghosts and demons in higher dimensional space, we were laughed at. It was very hard for us physicists to get jobs. People were saying, this is science fiction. This is not physics. We're talking about a theory of everything based on 10-dimensional hyperspace? Come on. Well, we had the last laugh. Because now, string theory is taught in all the major universities. All the Ivy League schools are scrambling to hire string theorists. And we now believe that the mind of God, the mind of God is music resonating through 10-dimensional hyperspace. After we give a talk on string theory, there's always somebody giggling in the back. There's always somebody, a cynic, who's just shaking his head, and then he has the courage to raise his hand and says, Professor, all this is hogwash. Einstein would say that a black hole is an extremely dense object, so dense that it begins to warp the fabric of space and time into a funnel. And in and some in sense, fact, that criticism has some validity. The this is a theory of creation. It's a theory of the Big Bang itself. Therefore, to test the theory rigorously, we have to recreate the Big Bang, which is not possible. At the present time, on Earth, no one is smart enough to solve this theory. Nobody on Earth can solve the equations that I and my colleagues have written down. However, when someone does solve this theory completely, we should find our universe as one of the solutions of this theory. So once we've solved the theory by pure thought, we should be able to compare it with the subatomic particles we see in nature, and the game is over. At that point, it's finished. So what if you find this equation? Are we going to get better color TV? Are we going to get better sliced bread? Are we going to get a better a microwave reception just because you have this fantastic unified field theory? And the answer is no. However, I do believe that one day the destiny of all intelligent life in the universe will hinge on this equation. Trillions of years from now, we physicists believe that the universe will end not in fire, but in ice. My thinking is, when we reach the end of the universe itself, we'll simply take the unified field theory and create a lifeboat. We'll create a bubble, a baby universe on our dying universe. And just like a lifeboat, we'll leave the mothership to go to perhaps another universe, a warmer, younger universe. So in some sense, perhaps the unified field theory may be the salvation for all intelligent life in the universe, 
which does not have to die when the universe dies. Sometimes late at night, when I'm all by myself, thinking that here we are on the threshold of the greatest breakthrough of all time, the creation of the theory of the universe, I say to myself, well, maybe it's all wrong. I mean, maybe we physicists don't know what the hell we're talking about. The string theory may be a theory of nothing rather than a theory of everything. That's the rub. String theory has no arbitrary parameters you can play with. You can't tweak it, you can't modify it. Therefore, if you solve it, either it's the entire universe or it's nothing at all. When I write symbols and letters on the blackboard and I play with them in my head, I ask myself a question that Einstein asked himself in the morning. If I'm going to create a universe, if I am God, how would I create this universe? And then I start to play with certain equations, and then I begin to realize they're ugly. And I say to myself, well, if I'm God, I don't want to live in a universe like this. And I scratch this out, and I say, no, no, it can't be right. It's too awkward. It's too clumsy. That's not the way I would create a universe if I'm God. The nature of existence, the nature of reality, the secret of the universe should be expressed in an equation one inch long, and I want to find it.